A warm welcome to another edition of the Magpie Circle. A member of Knox County's Goalkeeping Union is joining us today. And uh, although he comes hails from Northern Ireland, Knox County has become very, very much his club. Um, a very warm welcome, Soldini. Hi, mate. You okay? Yeah, Nick, delighted to have you. Um, from Derry originally. But you spent in total eight years at Knox, I believe, from, 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 from a young lad. We'll delve into all of that. You still continue to work with the Knox County Foundation. And I think as we've just been chatting before we start, you consider to Knox County to be very much your club. Just briefly, what, what, what impact, you know, what does Knox County mean to you? It uh, means um, everything, really. Give me um, a start in life, um, my first ever job. Um, Something that um, I'll never forget, leaving home, leaving a family of 13 behind at such a young age. Um, having all um, of nine brawlers who dreamed of being a footballer, and I was sort of the last of all of them to get the chance, but never really played football until I was about 13. Um, was always a big Gaelic footballer, um, massive in the hurling, all the sports rather than being a goalkeeper, but unfortunately I wasn't very good outfield, so... One day I jumped in goal and it worked. Well, you, 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 you certainly made that position your own. We're going to talk a great um, classic story, I think, about your birthday, which I think um, is, is, is quite brilliant. Um, so let, 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 let's delve straight in. Uh, we'll come back to your background in a moment. But you are celebrating your 22nd birthday. It's March the 12th, 2005. Knots are at home to Kidderminster Harriers at Meadow Lane. Um, take up the story about all the family coming over, etc. Just, just, just start the story and we'll talk you through. Well, I wish you didn't remember that day, but um, <laughs> look, we were actually playing at home against Kidderminster and I had 15 of my mates coming to England for the first time. So my dad arranged um, a minibus full of people to come across and just basically planned a perfect weekend. But unfortunately for me, um, I got sent off for losing control of really a, a situation that we were probably still in of getting something from a game, but um, I was a bit fiery when I was younger. I was a bit desperate to win and I sort of stuck a head on someone and got a red card. So th this was with seven minutes to go against Kidderminster, yeah? But what had happened two minutes on the tannoy just before you saw a bit of the red mist? Well, they actually um, announced that I got man of the match. <laughs> and then unfortunately um, I did get sent off and as much as the fans are fantastic I've always had a good a good spot with Nuts fans anyway and then um, obviously getting cheered off and I seen my dad pointing the finger at me to say you're dead when I get you <laughs> so that wasn't good did, did it affect the birthday celebrations afterwards? I presume it must have been with, with, all, with everyone coming over from Ireland um, not really you know, you know we're like um, it's part of life and it it was a it was a good lesson. Um, it made me realise that wearing the shirt meant a lot. Um, obviously, getting the opportunity so young for a goalkeeper was always a lot of pressure. of People thinking, "Am I going to be good enough?" Because um, I did follow on after a really really top goalkeeper in Darren Ward, so it was a, a lot of pressure. Because I think we went two or three seasons after that, where, in my own opinion, we we didn't really find that number one quick enough. And as being a as being a Knots fan anyway, it was always difficult. They looked past as someone didn't really snap that shirt up in them three or four seasons. And I was coming through really confident that I had the chance to do it. But obviously, um, it's it's a very difficult position. Okay, um, we'll talk about the art of goalkeeping uh, in a moment. Um, but let's go back, which you alluded to. So one of, um, did you say nine, nine brothers um, yeah, in, in Derry? What, what was those formative years like? Oh, fantastic. I wouldn't, um, to this day, I wish I could go back to being a child again. I had a really good upbringing, um, good parents, stable family, um, plenty of people to play with. I didn't have, I didn't need many friends. All my brothers are still like my best mates to today. Um, speak to them every day. There's not a day I would go past without speaking to my family, but I wouldn't move back to there. It was a it was a nice time to get away with the uh, the troubles and just really it was my it was always my drive to 
get away and do well for myself and sort of look after my family and stuff like that. So in a way, it was nice that I had the opportunity to do it. So, so how did you end up? Because I think more or less from the age of 15, you were first scouted and, and brought over. How, how did it all happen? What happened? Just basically playing for my local team, um, Foyle Harps at the time. Um, they had a big connection with Celtic, Peterborough, um, Newcastle, Norwich. So I, I was going, basically, they were trying to get me to play for their teams every week in goal because I played um, in goal for the local Gaelic team. But I didn't really want to convert to being a footballer, to be honest. And then um, the Gaelic sort of lost its funding, lost its, um, just basically lost the, the, the drive of like, football was overtaking the sport in Ireland where it started, it didn't really happen like that. And then I just basically got a few games with my local team and then started going to a few tournaments at Whitley Bay. Um, came to Liverpool, played a few competitions like the Milk Cup, the Foil Cup, and just got scouted really. And I was flying over to Peterborough and back every weekend. Um, went to Everton, went to quite a few clubs, but it was just to be honest, at that age, it was really annoying because no one knows how them clubs work. You're just a number. You're just you're just there, filling in gaps for all the people. So, so, so where did the Notts County connection come in? Um, with my local club, um, the a guy called um, Jerry um, Doherty said that um, the chief scout, Bob Shaw at the time, seen me play and he'd be interested if I would come over. So, um, obviously, I knew that Notts County, I knew who he was as a football club anyway, because obviously they were going through a terrific season in the 98-99 season where they were doing a league record. Yeah. And I had a little... Um, I remember watching like a few match of the day episodes, stuff like that online, trying to find out exactly who it was. And then I seen that they had a couple of Irish guys, Steve Finnan, they had um, uh, Vincent Sweeney, is it? Um, yeah. Midfielder. And I thought, oh, there's a connection. I knew a lot of lads from Ireland were at Forest. So I thought, must be a nice place. Came over, had a look. And you, you were only, what, 15 at this time? 15, yeah. Yeah. So I came over and loved it. And, and, and your first trial, I think you've been telling me, didn't quite go according to plan. In fact, it sounds bizarre, but you can explain, I'm sure. You refused yeah. to train, didn't you, at your first training session? Well, it was, it was a shock to go and train on a hockey pitch. I actually thought turning up, I'd be like going to dive around in the grass, as a normal person would do. But um, we went to Boots on um, the Lady Bay Bridge, and it was a hockey pitch of AstroTurf. And I had a pair of shorts and t-shirt. And that was it. I didn't have no bottoms. I didn't have no jumper. Back in them days, it was, you're off, there's your, there's your bag. My dad used to pack my bag, I used to go. And then when I came over, it wasn't that you were given any fancy kit like you would get now. It was just, right, you go and train. And it was a Friday night at um, Boots Sports Ground. And I was like, I can't dive on this on shorts and t-shirt. And it was quite funny because it was the community um, set up at the time. It wasn't even the academy. So I trained on the Friday and I played on the Saturday and ended up, the game went a lot better. And within an hour after it, Gary Brazil um, was the youth team coach. He said that he wanted to sign me. I mean, the goalkeeping coach was Steve Sutton back then. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember doing a session with Sutz and Don Ward and Paul Gibson. And I literally spoke to my dad that evening and said, I don't want to come home. And that was it. Really? Loved yeah, so I knew straight away I was perfect, yeah. And I think you must have been very highly rated. I was reading somewhere. Did you sign something like a four-year contract? Yeah, I did. Um, well, Derek Paper said, um, do, you like, do you like my pen? I went, oh, it's a bit fancy. He goes, well, you sign that paper, it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. so they were clearly must have been, knowing Derek as we all do, four years, that's a great contract to have, isn't it? As a, a 15 turning 16. It was good. Um, I signed the same day as Paul Heflin signed, so we both signed on the same day. Ah, oh, okay. So um, he signed us, and then he made us two the last two signings that he made as chairman. Yeah, so it was quite good. Yeah, very good. Did, did you? So, so you're a young Irish lad, sixteen, moving into a new city for the first time. How, how, how daunting was that? How did the club look after you? Did you and Hefs go into digs together? How did it all sort of work out uh, you know, on, from a life perspective as much as playing football? Um, yeah, I went into digs on um, Trent Bridge um, next yeah. to the forest ground. And for me, it, 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 was, it was heaven. 
it was honestly it was like moving on with a load of lads playing football listening to the roar of the crowd across the road of forest then going to the knots games it was just like what what else do you want as a kid it's like yeah you pinch yourself thinking to yourself yeah i moved away from my family but they're always going to be there this doesn't happen often you know what i mean so you have to make the most of it um and so what what was this still an era, you know, scholars, whatever you were referred to as, when you yeah. would be cleaning somebody's boots and all well, those, the jobs, was, that sort car, of initiations? Everything, cleaning cars. I used to have to clean terraces. Um, I probably had about six players' boots. Um, i seen it as if I can get more players, i got more money. <laughs> so I used to offer to do them all, where all the people, did, all the people used to complain about it. i seen it as like a luxury. <laughs> so I used to think to myself, well, it shows a good work ethic. It shows the right attitude. And used to run the baths, make the players a cup of tea. There was a few players um, I used to do stuff to their tea on purpose because they were quite rude. But I thought <laughs> that, that's part of life as well. And they, they, <laughs> you can also learn to live and look after yourself just as well. You can be kind and be nice. So, 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 so it sounds like you, you of, of that intake, you, you, you were the real grafter doing yours and quite a few other people's jobs as well. Um, I think I think I just had that thing coming from a big family. I was told that just be appreciative of what you get. And at the end of the day, I seen it as a job. I seen it as my first ever job. And if I don't do well, I'm just not going to get paid. So it's important that away from my family, I had to do something that was going to benefit me. So how long did you have to wait then before you get your um, first breakthrough, you know, a big reserve game, youth tie? Were, were you playing regularly in mid middle, is it middle and intermediate league then or whatever it was called? I was playing youth team football and um, I, literally they had James Lindley. Yes. They had him as the youth team keeper, so I was the year below him. Um, and they had um, Andrew Norwood. They both sort of got injured and... I sort of got in really, really quick. And I think back then it was like, okay, I'm playing a game of football, that's it. <laughs> and it was like, then I ended up, got, I got on the bench after I think it must have been four or five months away to Bury in a cup game. And I remember the night quite well. Darn Ward, was, he used to suffer with a bad back, quite bad. And he got injured. And I remember I absolutely shot myself. <laughs> thinking, oh God, if I have to go on, this is going to be fun. But I ran down the line and I couldn't feel my legs. They went that heavy. I thought there must have been the adrenaline or the nerves kicking in. And on the bus, everyone was laughing, saying, oh, you were cropping yourself. And I actually said, I was. And Did you I was what, 17 at that point? I think I was turning 17, yeah. Which for a goalkeeper, it's young enough for an outfield. But for a goalkeeper, yeah. that is really young to be on the verge of the pro rank. Yeah. It was um, really young. But I think just from having that experience and traveling on the bus because what we used to do was if we didn't have a game on the saturday they used to nominate two players to travel with the first team to make the teas do all the food yeah uh, and used to get paid used to you probably come off the bus they'd all chuck three four quid and, and you come off the bus with like between two lads 50 quid and i used to think i'll go every week <laughs> because in a way i was taught when my dad was like be around them people as much as you possibly can and keep your face in there. Keep showing them that you want to be there and get used to that kind of this a way of living because that's what I was striving to do, get onto that bus as soon as I can as a player. And then it happened really quick. From the age of 17, I was 18, I was traveling with the first team every week. Um, then I was playing the youth team games or the youth cup games. So it happened, and then I was traveling with Ireland. I got into the international scene really quick. So it happened really fast. I think that's a very interesting point about at a very early age, even if you're not going to play, be in and around the first team squad because it's all yeah. part of the learning curve, coping with nerves, all the rest of it. You know, at the minute, and there is no right, no wrong. Uh, we we don't name uh, as you would know. Um, we don't name a replacement goalkeeper on the bench. You yeah. know, Neil, Neil's view uh, is that we have more options by just going without field players. Yeah. But, but, but as a goalkeeper, it's a very specialist position. And clearly, you don't often get on from being a replacement keeper. But if it's a young lad travelling with a team, some of those experiences, 
a, a vital and important and what you've just outlined now I remember Neil Warnock used to tell me that he used to take nominate some younger youth players yeah. to travel yeah even if they weren't yeah. in the squad just travel be in and around it see what happens how people conduct themselves and clearly you you, you loved that by the sounds of it um yeah I, I loved it to the point where when then I traveled to be on the bench it became quite frustrating so there's a difference of being around it as a young kid seeing how people are living and preparing for games but when you're actually doing it yourself and watching i spent a lot of years probably wasting a lot of time sitting on the bench when really i should have been playing games yeah. and i think that's probably my biggest regret i i let managers make me believe that yeah i'm part of the squad and i'm important but the reality is as a goalkeeper you need to play you are better dropping down the leagues playing week and week out and yet, a young kid can go and get that experience. But nowadays, there's no such thing as you're too young to be a goalkeeper. The younger you can get used to being in between the stakes and dealing with the pressure of making mistakes and growing as a young adult or an older, experienced goalkeeper, the better. Were you able to get out on loan in your early years at Knox or not? Was that not an option and, for you? No, I went, I went a couple of times. I went to like Ilkeston, Gresley, um, but they brought me back really quickly. Um, because I was young, they brought me back to sit on the bench. And to be honest, that was still really important because I had a fantastic goalkeeper. I probably had one of the best goalkeeper coaches I ever had. And Steve Sutton, fantastic. Like doing a warm up and a match day with him was like playing a game. You prepared if you were starting. And that, that really helped for when I did go all the places. But the reality is, it doesn't help you with like making um, them decisions on a match day and playing in front of say, three, four, five, six thousand people, it's, it's a lot different because if you're on the bench, you really don't have that pressure of performing to the level the first-choice goalkeeper would have. OK, so you did get your full debut. Um, March the 29th, 2003, home to Huddersfield. 1-3-2. Yeah. What, what can you remember about that? And perhaps how was it handled leading up to that and you being told you were going to make your full debut? Oh, it was... It was um, Clear, it's still clear. I've, most of the games I've played are still clear in my mind because I love playing that much. Um, I remember getting told I was playing the whole night. I was listening to music, staying awake, thinking, I don't want to sleep, I just want it to happen. Um, I'm, I felt like I was ready. Who was in charge uh, then? Who gave you a debut? I think it was Billy Deer. No, Billy Gary Deer. Mills. Yeah. yeah. And I think it was Gary Mills actually. Yeah. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, Obviously, the person believes in me, but it wasn't that. I felt like I did that much training. I needed to find out because a lot of people think they can do it until they're actually put in that spot to do it. It's a completely different feeling. What was the game like? Can you remember it all? Yeah, it was good. Um, it was a nice warm day. I remember, um, obviously, not the cop now. They used to have the fans in the far um, side of the ground, if you remember, next to the family stand. Um, yeah. I remember like busy and um, I always remember because we used to warm up that side um, as a goalkeeper you were quite close to them so I used to always think to myself I'll go over I used to like to warm up next to the fans so I could get used to the atmosphere um, and I used to like seeing the young kids it used to make me feel like I was doing good for people and it felt important and you got that taste, and was then it a case of you, you, you clearly you would want more as quickly as possible, yeah? Yeah, I had quite a few games, um, yeah. and the season, and then the season after, um, I was more or less made number one, um, which was fantastic. Um, I had a great season. Um, I think Ian Richardson got um, player of the season. I came second, but I think I think they only gave it to Richo because of his manager, and he and he did a few <laughs> he did a few collections. I say West Bridgeford, I think, for the club. <laughs> so I they beat me because of that. Yeah, I mean, um, what was the camaraderie? What can you remember of that group of players, um, banter, the crack, that sort of thing? And we had some lively ones. Um, we had a couple of lads on loan, like David Pipe, um, who used to love taking his shirt off, so we used to rip him, but he did have a, a great body, so it was quite easy to see why. But then you had the older lads who were like really, really good, like um, Kevin Rapley, Mark Stallard, um, even the likes of Richardson, Boroughclough. But I'm lucky that when I joined Knotts, they had that 
um, great title winning season. So the, I remember Sam Allardyce, his manager, when I signed, I remember going into his office, he would have a cigar, a bottle of beer. And I used to think, bloody hell, he's like one of the Sopranos. He's not even a manager. <laughs> but when, when you see how football's gone now, it's, it's actually, you would sometimes be scared to go into the manager's office back then, where now it's, it's like just going to talking to someone that you're actually playing with. Yeah, I mean, Sam was a, a very, very larger-than-life character. I mean, you, you say he went yeah. into his office. I would think he could be quite intimidating as well, couldn't he? Oh, yeah, I remember. I used to take him a coffee and I used to think, please like it. Um, <laughs> but then everyone used to say, make sure he doesn't like it because you won't have to see him again. But I used to find it the opposite way, right? I want him to like it so I could see him more so he knows who I am. So, but, um, yeah, it was funny. He was sitting there um, and he'd have... Um, Alex Dyer, you have all the older guys in there chatting, and I was just think, oh God, here we go. Yeah, I mean, it's a common theme. Well, a lot of the younger players talking about in those early days, knocking on the door of, and going into the manager's office. Greg Tempest uh, said it's probably each time he had to do it the most terrifying and nerve wracking moment of his life. Bar yeah. none. Bar none. Yeah, it, it is a nice, especially when you're young, but. I think the older I got, I think I just got a lot more, a lot more confident in myself that it is your career, and unfortunately, there's no one going to look after it for you. You'll have agents and you'll have people there to guide you, but they're looking after themselves too. So you have to sort of adapt to some situations and realize that you sometimes have to do what's best for yourself. I mean, you mentioned Ian Barraclough then, of course, um, we've got Ian on as a guest as well. And, of course, manager of the Northern Ireland national team. Could you, could you ever imagine yeah. that? Um, I always thought he'd be a manager. Um, he actually, I think, went um, the right way about it by starting off and working his way up. But he's done um, fantastic work in Northern Ireland and in the South. He's been a Sligo Rovers as well. He's done a great job there. And then, obviously, um, now he's in Northern Ireland doing a good job. And, He's, he's always been one of them people that I'm sure if anyone rung him who he played with, he would chat to you and give you the best advice possible. Really, really nice guy. And another one of your goalkeeping successes at Knox, because there's strong links with Northern Ireland, um, Roy Cowell, who Ian was telling us he's just brought him back into the Northern Ireland FA as an as yeah. age group goalkeeping coach, as, yeah. as well as coming out of yeah. retirement for Dungannon at the age of 83. So Yeah, I, I actually watched him at the weekend. Uh, I think he needs a haircut. He's wearing a headband now. It's quite funny. <laughs> he, was, he was a good keeper for Knotts. Well, he was a great keeper full stop, but he did do well yeah. for Knotts. He did do great, yeah. So, But um, down, that, down that line, when he came to Knotts, he um, was in uh, Turkey or somewhere, wasn't he playing? That's it. Yeah. And then he, he, was, he wasn't playing, was he? Yeah. No, he wasn't playing. But I was at Derby with Roy whenever Nigel Clough took over and he, got, he um, let him go. But he was a fantastic keeper. Very good. Um, so let, let's talk about some of the games that you, you made a, roughly 60 appearances. Um, and um, some of the most memorable, I guess, would have been um, cup games. Um, you, you certainly seemed to make a, uh, have a few against Middlesbrough um, and, and, and get some half-decent results. Um, do you remember those Middlesbrough games and, 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 the, and the team Middlesbrough had out? Because they had about everybody out for, for those. Yeah. Good players out. They used to have, um, I think they had Hasselbank, Paducah, um, they had Claude Mendieta, um, South Mendieta, South yeah, Echiog, Woodgate. They had yeah. some, more, some really good players, but I think that was the Carlin Cup or something back yeah. then. And um, yeah, we we always seemed to do quite well against them because they seemed to probably, like back then, think that we were sort of, it's like your cup dreaming that you want to beat someone, but. Um, I think the one that stands out though is when we lost at Meadow Lane 2-1 we were very unlucky Tony Scully scored from like the touchline that's and it they scored two two really good goals from the edge of the box two good strikes but we played some great stuff that then we, we should have scored more we had a really a couple of good chances that on an all day someone like Paul Heffernan or Stallard or they probably would have put them away but we just couldn't get that goal to kill off the game and they grew back in there and obviously beat us 2-1 that's exactly right. 8th of January 2005, you're quite yeah. right, the FA Cup. But then you got a bit of revenge in 2006 yeah. um, because you got them in the League Cup. Uh, was that first oh, round? Was... And because you played in all these, 
first yeah. round. Do you remember going to uh, Crystal Palace? I do, yeah. Peter Taylor was manager then, who um, I played under at Hull, won the Division Two title with Hull on loan for a season. I went there with him, and then he became England manager after that. Yeah, I do remember that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was obviously a great result, but Middlesbrough at their place, and you got a clean sheet, didn't you? I did, yeah. So must have hit me by mistake that night. <laughs> what do you remember of that one? Um, I think it was quite a quite tight game. It wasn't much in it. And I think, um, I think we scored near the end, to be honest. I think the 83rd minute, same around 80, 34 minute. But I think I made a couple of really good saves. I think um, that night, it seemed like everything was hitting me. And it was like a lot of shots was from distance. So I remember they were trying to shoot from anywhere. And they had, um, I don't know if you remember, Ivan Christie used to be at Derby. Yes, or, yes, I did. Yes. Christie. He was there and he had a couple of really quick strikers. And we, we sort of defended quite deep on the night and we did really well. So I think um, that, that was a really good night, that was. Yeah, I think it was always a bit of a, it was a source of anticlimax, wasn't it? Having got through to the fourth round, that you then get a tie with Wickham at yeah. home, that you kind of think, oh, right, OK, that's fan fantastic opportunity because it didn't work out lost one nil and that was the end mm. of the cup run wasn't it yeah it was um that was a that was a tough game i remember that they um it was a 2-1 uh i've got it down as 1-0 i've got one it down nil. as 1-0 one one nil. yeah i think I, I think it was near the end i think tommy moody might have scored yeah and, um yeah it was i think uh, they've i'm not sure if it had been like where they've hit the shot and i've fumbled it is it and they got the rebound if i could remember it and that was quite near the end, but I, I think I really remember that because I was having a great game. And I remember making that one little mistake that probably on a normal day was probably a quite routine shot. And um, obviously they got the rebound. But um, yeah, that, that was a shame because we were on a great, that season we were having some good, cup, really good cup runs and obviously bringing some money and at the time when it was desperately needed. Um, so as a goalkeeper, um, what... What's different? Because clearly, you know, you, you, you work and train uh, with the person that's either trying to take your place or the person whose place you're trying to take. Yeah. And, and a, left, a left-sided a left player might be able to play left wing, left, left, uh, left side of a, a back three, uh, a left yeah. back. There are more options. Yours is only one option, isn't there? There's only one option. Yeah. I mean, what, 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 are the, what are the mental dynamics and mechanics of that like? I think it's patience. Um, a lot of it is patience. You need to be very... And I think it's gone different now. Goalkeeping's evolving around um, speed and agility, where back then you could be big, you could be carrying a bit of weight. Now it's more about the ball's quicker, everything's quicker. But the basics are still the same, of the movement, the hands and the feet. But I think most of it's the patience. You need to be calm in certain situations and just... Just take your time. Just do the work, repetition, day in, day out, and don't get bored of it. I think um, at times I was very impatient when I was younger, and I, I was desperate to play, play, play. But maybe sometimes I didn't train as well as I probably should have until I got the like, say, when I was 26, day 29, I started realizing the importance of training rather than just playing. So I think. Try and be patient and let the people that work with you do their job. You don't need to do it for them. That was the thing. Okay. Um, in total, 60 appearances. Um, knots being knots, there's always a high churn of managers. I mean, yeah. how, how was that as a goalkeeper? Um, did you felt like you keep having to prove yourself? You mentioned... For a period of time, there wasn't really a, a real, real first choice number one. There was Stephen Mildenhall, there was yourself. Your garden, your yourself. Garden. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had three or four. But I think we had, I think when I was there, we had seven managers. <laughs> um, yeah, we had Gary Brazil, who was interim. Then we had Jockey Scott, Steve Thompson, Billy Dearden, Gary Mills. Oh, it was, it was tough. Um, and then it ended up. Um, I left under good John Ferguson, if you remember, oh, that year. And yeah. to be honest, I never, I just never clicked with that person. Um, didn't click with his, his staff, his goalkeeping coach. And I just felt like no matter what he was trying to do, there was just no way out. And I just, I felt the time was right just to sort of say, you know what, 
take a step back and and rebuild and it in a way it worked because I got a lot higher through hard work and basically becoming a good number two which is no in any sense people probably might not understand but for me it was still I actually enjoyed doing that than I did playing for someone that just didn't value me at all because we offered a contract and turned it down I couldn't yeah. quite yeah like, so Ian Richardson was a manager and he offered me a new contract and um, I turned it down because um, he ended up not getting the job. <laughs> right. And they took good John Ferguson and then when he came in, um, basically he didn't tell me he signed Kevin Pilkington. Yeah. And he told me then if I don't sign the contract that I'm not going to be number one. So I just turned around and said, well, unfortunately that's, not how it works and I, if you want to sign me you would try and encourage me to sign not basically threaten me and tell me that you aren't going to be playing unless I see you playing kind of thing and I just didn't like that I felt like I had a good season I felt like um, the chairman and the club was perfect for me but I think then my head started getting doubts that this wasn't the right thing I had a goalkeeping coach who I just did not like I didn't feel like um, it was going to work and I just felt like I'd take the, take the risk of moving on which in the end I, did, I didn't, want to, didn't want to do it but when he left I came back to the club and yeah. I found the club just um, just moved on from where I was and um, it was a shame because at that time the club went through a really difficult spell under Steve Thompson Yes yeah I think it's inevitable yeah. and probably more so a goalkeeper than most other positions um, when you have a high churn of managers, it's difficult to always be the type of goalkeeper, the quality of goalkeeper, because different managers want different things in a goalkeeper sometimes, don't well, they? Well, definitely. And I was still young and I was only 23, 24. So them managers didn't want young goalkeepers in. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. And I was, um, I was obviously young, very ambitious, thinking I've just come out of the under 21 Ireland squad. I've just played a full, my full first season. I was raring to go, chopping at the bit, and then to get set back on the bench for a year, it was difficult to not accept because you should never think you should be playing unless you're, you deserve to play. I think that's how it should be. And like I said, maybe that first six months under the new manager and not signing my contract, I was in a different place. I was not probably training properly. I was a bit down. But I think the difference between now and back then is they would have someone who could talk to you Back, well, no, but back then they wouldn't have known they talked to you, it being more or less get your finger out and show us what you're made of. Where nowadays you'd have someone there, they give you a bit of support and a bit of help. Yeah, I mean, infrastructures at football clubs have started certainly to move in the right direction, yeah. and it is likely they will probably continue moving along, along that road as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you signed on the same day as Paul Heffernan. Um, so, did, did you have, did, as a result of signing on the same day, Irish lineage, was, 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 were you two quite close then together as you yeah, went through the ranks? Yeah, best mates, yeah. We um, just got on well. He was very laid back, very, very quiet, never said much. Um, where I like to go out and talk to people and socialise and do my thing, he would very much go train and go home and he wouldn't move until the next day. He was very, very quiet, um, but really good footballer, very good player. Did you share digs with him for a while? Yeah, I did. I used to live in a house with him for about five years as well, yeah. Yeah. What was that like? Were you, t were you two all right? Yeah, it was all right. He couldn't cook, though. That was the only problem. <laughs> Apart from pasta, I had to teach him how to cook. Because <laughs> he, he, he's gone back, I was reading somewhere, he's gone back to Ireland, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. One of the things that not for all the challenges they were going through, um, they normally had a 20-goal-a-season man, didn't they? Which is yeah. weird, because often a, a, a side doesn't get where it wants to be because he can't score the goals, but you had Stallard banging them in. Hef had a phenomenal, at least one phenomenal season. And, and he had Danny Allsop as well. And yeah. they were all 20-plus-a-season strikers, weren't they? Yeah, they was, yeah. Denfrey had a really good season. I think back then, though, we really... Um, it was just difficult to think we had, like, midfield, but it, it, it lacked a lot of legs. Um, <laughs> It like a uh, lot of running power, you know what I mean? Like pace, more or less, we lacked. We, we had fit lads, but 
it wasn't like the pace that you probably needed to be pushing to win titles and stuff like that. Uh, goalkeeper, goalkeepers union, were you all right behind your centre halves? Yeah, we had, um, well, when I played, it was Ian Richardson and um, then we had Julian Bordeaux. We had, we had a few good ones, yeah. So um, they were all right. Um, fullbacks, good. Richard Holmes, remember Richard Holmes? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. Had some good ones. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Um, the, the door ends up being closed um, at Knotts, and people forget you were still you were still very young then, weren't you? You know, this, this, yeah. you weren't twenty nine, were you? You were uh, early mid twenties. Yeah, so I went down to Burton Albion with um, Nigel Clough, so and um, I went there for a season, and then I came back to Knotts. Yeah, for and and um, it was basically I went to uh, Burton. They were in the Conference North. They got promoted into the conference, and then he said, "Look, um, we're not going to be able to give you the contract you want." Um, Steve Thompson phoned me to come back to not to be back up to Kevin Pilkington. I thought, you know what? I, I don't want to leave the club in the first place. I felt like I should never have got let go. I thought I'd come back, give it a go, and just never played. Pilks had a fantastic two years for the club. He did well. I didn't have any right to think I can just step in and play. Um, and he, to be fair, he kept me out of his side for a good full season. I got in, I think, for about six games. Um, did okay. Just didn't, didn't really feel like I was comfortable in that position because I felt like the manager obviously liked experience. And it was it was just one of them things. And I actually still learned quite a lot from Pilks at the time because he he was one of the first goalkeepers I came across who actually worked so hard at training and he was very fit and I, and I took a lot from that and it, it hurt me to be thinking ability wise I probably felt oh I, I see myself above this but I just can't outwork this guy he was like very dogged um, so, so how did you then go about inverted commas in <clears throat> stage two of your career just basically I went away I had a I had a look at myself thinking, you know what, I need to get fitter, I need to um, work harder, I need to take a step back, get a level where I'm comfortable. And I went back to Burton Albion and I, I worked probably, it was only part-time at the time, so it let me work part-time on the football basis, but then it let me work the extra bit, like going to the gym, working out, keeping fit and getting away from a lot of distractions. So and I think that that really gave me that appetite to think I got fitter, had a really good time at Burton, and then we got promoted from the conference into the League Two, and Nigel went to um, Derby, and basically just said to me that I'm going to be coming with him. And when someone tells you that, it's like you've won the lottery from Burton Albion, who just got into the league. But that was an amazing club. That's probably one of the best dressing rooms I've ever been in in my life just for the fact that people it was just a normal it was like going to be a normal job it, people weren't better than anyone people weren't money was never mentioned nothing was mentioned you used to turn up and work vans people would be cycling there you'd have to pick people up on the way it was it was brilliant so, so my good friend from my time when I was at Leicester uh, Robbie Savage was there so he'd, he'd keep you on your toes wouldn't he well yeah he, he didn't moan though oh <laughs> <laughs> you could you couldn't listen to him for long. <laughs> I'm sure Sav would tell a different story. So so Derby, um, but you, you, I think you mentioned earlier in the interview, um, you kind of almost became the number two there, didn't you? For for, for yeah. quite a period of time, yeah. So, yeah. So I went there for four years, but I was injured for 28 months. I um had a really really horrible shoulder injury. Um, so I ruptured the bicep tendon and subscap completely off. And then I had an older nerve problem. So I had like about 10 uh, surgeries. And that, that was really difficult. Um, but I managed to get back. But um, I got back. I couldn't keep up the training. I couldn't manage my body. I couldn't. I could train for a week or two. And then I'd be back in the physio room for three months. It, it, was, it was just pointless. I was chasing things that I was never going to get to again. So I just felt like the time was right to say that's enough. Okay, so so what happened then? I just um I remember sitting on the Costa Coffee on Mapley Top, <laughs> and um I remember thinking, oh, I'll ring Richo 
because I, I speak, I, sp- I used to play golf with Richard quite a lot. Um, and I rung him and I just said, oh, is there any, do you need any help with the um, football in the community it was back then? And he goes, oh, well, we've got summer camps running at South Glade. I can get you to do a couple of days up there. And I remember doing it and there was like 50 kids screaming, going nuts. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? But after doing it for about six weeks, I actually felt like I find somewhere where I'm quite comfortable. I find somewhere where it didn't matter what kid came up to you. You just felt like you were just a normal person. And I really enjoyed that. So how many years ago was that then? So that would have been um, about four years, five years ago. And, and you're still with, because it, it's been rebranded now, so you're still yeah. with the Notts County they, Foundation. So, yeah? yeah, yeah. So um, absolutely love it. Um, I work in the um, education and the Heading for Goals um, project with um, an ex, an all ex football Martin Crovers. Yes. Um, so I work with him. Um, I'm the behaviour mentor coach. So I work with young children who are excluded from mainstream, trying to get them back into schools. So I'm um, really good. Um, just feel really comfortable. Feel like I'm quite content. I'll get the just be normal. I just feel like it's just a normal everyday thing that you do. I'm comfortable doing it. I enjoy being around the kids. I enjoy helping kids feel like there's still opportunities out there, no matter how bad it might be. There's always someone out there who'll look up to you and use you for some reason that will make you better. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing you find it very rewarding. And it's also interesting that Effectively, from when you came over from Northern Ireland just before the millennial, um, 98, 99, you've spent an awful lot of time, well, you've made Nottingham your home, and Notts County is a club that you've, that you've been kind of tied to for a long period of time without necessarily having played 600 appearances for the club. Because, you know, two decades is a long time in football to be, broadly speaking, associated with the one club. Yeah, I've... And I've loved every minute of it. I still, even now when I watch the games, I still feel like I wish I was still playing. Um, I wish I was still out there. I feel like some days I've seen him training. Obviously, I know quite a few of the players. Um, I know Michael Doyle quite well. I played with him in the 21s. Um, and Did you? So, you, yeah. so you played in the same... On the 21s as Michael Doyle, yeah. So um, we had a really good squad back then. But even then, it's... It's um, for the first few months when Michael signed, I actually just walked past him every day before talking to him. <laughs> and he walked past me, but then one day he just said hello. But I'm, the, I'm quite happy because I understand they're there to do a job and I'm there to do my job. I just feel like I'm quite happy they do my own thing. <laughs> so, so what was Doyle like in the under-21s all them years ago? Still as good as he is now. Good player. Um, very vocal. <laughs> um, but... At the end of the day, you need them characters. You need the people that say what they think. And then you need the other people who do the dirty work. And you need the people who can make people laugh. And that's what football's about. But it's not easy. So, so, so how much credit, you know where I'm going now, how much credit are you going to take for his goalkeeping performance the other night? Absolute zero. I thought it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he passed the ball, but it managed to hit him. Were, were you surprised he went in goal? To be honest, I, don't, I, I didn't even know until later that night um, when I looked on Twitter and I looked on Facebook and stuff, I've seen it. But sometimes the people, he's the captain and the ladies, by example, he probably felt um, that was the right thing to do. But I just didn't understand why the player just didn't put it a bit higher. When you look at something so small, it just doesn't make sense, does it? But um, fair play to him. Listen, at the end of the day, the club... We're on a good run at the minute. It's important. Obviously, Saturday we had a bad defeat, but um, you would have took one defeat in the last 10 games. So um, we just have to get back to winning ways. And like I say, it's nice to see that things are turning. I think Neil's done a good job, but I think we could do with a few more additions to the squad to help us sort of push on there. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think the most important thing at the minute, it does at the minute look like we're going to get the season done. Yeah, you know, I think clearly that that would have that was a worry not 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 too many weeks ago. Um, I mean, you would consider yourself very much now part of the Notts County fabric and, and and a Nottingham person. I think we were saying you don't get back to Derry too much now. This no. is, you you consider this to be your home and Notts County the club that you that you follow. Well, yeah. Um, obviously, I've been here a long time. Um, 
I work for the club, I have played for them. Um, I know a lot of people around Nottingham who support them. And at the end of the day, I just think the city is fantastic. I've always enjoyed being here. I've got a lot of good friends. Um, and basically, I think I see the rest of my life in Nottingham anyway. So um, why not work for a club that give me the best job in the world? It it's, makes sense, doesn't it? It's a great note to end on. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks for sparing the time. Um, some great stories. Um, hopefully that 22nd birthday wasn't spoiled too much all those years ago. Um, well, and, and you do excellent work, um, the Dots County Foundation. We with the Magpie Circle have partnered on one or two initiatives recently with them. Yeah. Um, so excellent work that all the team do there. And um, let's hope that um, if any more goalkeeping tips are needed by Mr Doyle, You'll know where to come now, won't you? Well, if not, if not, um, I'll always um, volunteer to go and sit on the bench. Don't worry. It's all right. <laughs>